Avioran. My name is David Peterson, and this is The Art of Language Invention. Episode 17, Head Marking. Head marking may sound really fancy and complicated, but it really, really, really isn't. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, basically, if you follow phrasal grammar, there is a part of a phrase that's going to be the most important part, and that's the head. We're going to focus on three structures right now. Uh, verb, uh, you know, ver rep regular verb clauses or verb phrases, um, possessive phrases, and adpositional phrases. Uh, in each of these, you have a head element and a dependent element. So, for example, uh, in a verb phrase, uh, the, what they say is the head is the verb, and the dependents are all of its arguments, that is, subject, object, and indirect object. In an adpositional phrase, the adposition is the head, and the uh, nominal, uh, the noun phrase, that is, is its dependent. So on the house, the house would be the dependent, and on would be the head. And then for a uh, possessive phrase, the possessed uh, noun is the head, and the possessor is the dependent. Because if you're talking about uh, the man's book, you're talking about the book, not about the man. So the book is actually... Uh, the dependent, I'm sorry, the book is the is the head there, it's the thing in charge, the thing you're talking about. So, dependent marking is simply uh, marking the dependents and all of those phrases that I just discussed, marking them with some sort of, you know, morphology. And then head marking is doing the exact opposite. So we're going to look at those three types of phrases and I'm going to show you how they work. We're going to start with the easiest one, adpositional phrases. Um, we're going to use a preposition just because. Uh, you could do the same thing with a, pos a postposition, just uh, flip the order there. Um, so the preposition that we're going to be using is in, and it, uh, we're going to come up with a fake form for it. So souk, for example. Souk means in, inside, whatever. Inessive, illative, it doesn't matter in this case. So uh, dependent marking is you would have this uh, preposition, and that preposition would assign some sort of case to the noun that it modifies. Um, you see this in tons of languages. Sometimes it doesn't um, you know, assign a case, and sometimes it does. But even in English, where we don't have cases, if you say that something is in uh, a person, so like uh, you would say in me, not in I. So obviously the in there is assigning some sort of case, and you know uh, that it has been modified because you changed the dependent. So um, doing the opposite then, marking the head instead of the dependent, would be having some sort of little marking on the preposition. So in order to do this, uh, the way this usually happens in languages is you first need a set of uh, uh, suffixes that have to do with person. So here are some. Um, there they are, so like, you know, du means me, si means you, he means he, she, it, whatever. Um, and so when you say in it, you would say suke. And so you have this little suffix, it's, uh, it's you know, kind of like a, it's a bound thing, and so it attaches to the preposition, and that's how you say in it. Now, if you were wanted to say in the house, so house is monu, uh, we have the preposition suk. You don't say suk monu and then uh, modify the noun with some sort of case. Instead, you say suke molu. So suke becomes like in it. That's the thing that has marking. And then molu is completely and totally unmarked. Again, there can be a difference where like in English, there's no difference between a nominal that's case marked and one that isn't. Um, but presumably in a language where there is some sort of a difference, um, you would see uh, that molu gets some sort of marking when it's uh, preposed by preposition. Here it gets no marking at all. It gets uh, absolutely, um, you know, clean marking, and uh, the preposition instead has some sort of a change. And then this works for all third-person arguments. Uh, so that's what head marking looks like with an adpositional phrase. Again, flip it around for uh, postpositions, doesn't matter. Next, we're going to talk about possessive phrases. So let's talk about a very usual uh, possessive pair, like, for example, the fish is flower, since uh, fish are the master of flowers, and so all fish own all flowers. You, if you wanted to say uh, something like um, the fish is flower, a dependent marking strategy would be luniniwak. So we're talking about flowers, if you're in the, in the phrase the fish is flower. 
So the thing that we're talking about is the head, the flower. So Luni here has no marking. Niwak is fish with a little suffix on there, presumably a genitival suffix. That's dependent marking. Even though it's the possessor, like so it's the semantic, uh, you know, semantically it's the dominant one in this phrase. Grammatically it's the dependent. It's the thing that's not being discussed in the sentence. And so because it gets the marking, this is dependent marking. For head marking, you could flip that right around. And so you could say, uh, Lunik Niwa, still saying the fish's flower, but now it's like there's something attached to, um, to flower instead of fish. There is a name for this type of a case, and I will give it to you in a pop-up because I can't remember what it is. I don't know if it's the construct state or something like it is in Arabic, but whatever. It's the opposite of this. That's one way to do it, but actually the most, uh, the, the usual way of doing it is to do it with these possessive markers. So we'll just uh, borrow the ones we've already created uh, from the previous example. And the usual way you would do this is say like, again, the fish is flower. You'd have lunihe uh, niwa. So flower, it's, and then fish, and fish has no marking whatsoever. It's just completely bare. Um, what you have is uh, a, a possessive marker on flower, which is the head. That lets you know that there is a possessive construction and lets you know how to interpret the unmarked uh, noun that comes directly after it. So that is what head marking looks like in a, uh, in a possessive construction. And you might be wondering, well, what happens when, um, you know, what happens when this thing has to play a grammatical role in the sentence? And usually what happens is uh, a language like this will have some sort of a separate marking strategy for case, and they will stack um, however it's done. If it's done with the add positions, if it's done with suffixes, however it's done, the things will stack. To give you an example, let's use a very simple uh, fake, fake little bit of conlang here. So simple verbs, uh, independent pronoun, and we're going to say, I see the fish's flower. Then what you would say is, uh, tu koa lunihel niwa. So here we have uh, the same possessive suffix, the he, uh, attached directly to luni. So we know that it's a, it, is the, uh, uh, it is being possessed in this thing. And then you have the L on the end there, that's an accusative uh, suffix that presumably this little language bit uses everywhere. And so you have kind of like the little separate possessive suffix, the separate accusative suffix, and then again, the totally unmarked possessor, uh, which is the dependent. So that's how that's done. If you wanna see a uh, real, a natural language example of it, uh, look up Hungarian. You can just do like, I don't know, um, in the house versus in John's house, and then compare that to just John's house and house, and you can see how that works. Nice little ah suffix there, and then a ban suffix on the end. It's, it's, it's good times. Now let's talk about the difficult one, the verbs. So uh, to give you a simple example, if we're gonna continue with koa, our, our verb for C, then something like I see you would be tusi koa. It's, this is going to look like something different, you know, something like you might see in Spanish. Um, but uh, just stick with me and you'll see exactly how this works. Now, if we wanted to introduce a ditransitive verb like give, the way you would say, for example, I give it to you would be tu hesimai. So you have uh, three separate markers on there, one for the subject, one for the indirect object, and one for the direct object in that particular order. So that's the simple example. Let's start with that, and now let's move on to a more uh, series of more complicated examples. The way these markings work is, you know, sometimes they will be, you know, three prefixes like that, very, very separable. Sometimes it's a mix of prefixes and suffixes, sometimes all suffixes. The order is usually very important, um, but uh, not only that, sometimes you can get blends with these things, and so the suffixes and prefixes won't be quite as separable. So, for example, coming up with just two nonce examples, if, you, if I wanted to say you see me, uh, using our same, if we had our same set of pronouns that we've been working with, you see me might be swakoa, where you can't really separate the you and the me there, and I see you might be chekoa. Again, uh, is inseparable you and me there, things that you just have to memorize, but that stuff is marked directly on the verb. 
Um, now, if we want to look at a different example, let's say that we had all third-person arguments. So there's no question about the, the I's and U's uh, cluttering things up. Let's do all third-person arguments, and let's go to a sentence from an old video. Uh, the girl gives a flower to the fish. All right. So here's one way of doing it. You could say, kiri luni ni wa mai. That's very simple. No marking at all. Just, uh, you know, there are all your arguments. Word order determines what's what. Now let's see what it looks like with head marking. One way to do it is to say, make a distinction between animate and inanimate arguments. So here is uh, that sentence again. Kiri luni ni wa anamai. Here what you have is an a prefix that has to do with animate things, a n prefix that has to do with inanimate things, and a strict order of affixes, uh, animate, inanimate, animate. So if you have this, presumably you could kind of uh, mix up the order of things, except that uh, you won't know who gave what, uh, uh, you, you won't know, uh, you will know what was given, but you won't know who gave it to whom. Um, so presumably you'd have to figure out a way to distinguish between the girl and the flower. Otherwise you'd have a fish giving a flower to a girl, which makes absolutely zero sense, as I'm sure you know. Um, so that's one way. You could also do it a totally different way. Uh, for example, um, this is the way that uh, so a language like Swahili would do it. So, kiri luni niwa ki luni mai. Here we have a fixed order for the prefixes. Uh, again, it's a subject, indirect object, and direct object. Um, but there's also an extensive gender system. So in this one, we just made up that the, the uh, first syllable of each word is actually its gender uh, prefix. Um, you know, Swahili's got like, what, 18? It depends on how you count it. It's gender like in the tens. So it's usually pretty easy to figure out who does what to whom. You know, Swahili has no case marking whatsoever. All of this stuff is marked directly on the verb. And since the odds are that you're going to be getting lots of different genders uh, in a given sentence, it's very, very easy to figure out who does what to whom because it's marked very specifically on the verb uh, and, the, and the prefixes are all different. Um, so that's, uh, that's another way to do it. Next, let's look at a language like, uh, like something like how Georgian would do it. So using our, our same uh, our same nouns, we have Kiri Lunil Niwas Hasmaya. The way that this works is that there are two prefixes on the verb that mark the uh, direct object and indirect object uh, in that order. Um, and then there's a suffix that marks the subject or agrees with the subject. But you'll also notice something else. Uh, each of those nouns is case marked. We have the subject, which is unmarked, but then we have suffixes for the object, uh, the direct object, and the indirect object. Because this is basically what Georgian does. It marks all the stuff on the verb, but it also has, um, you know, a very stable and, you know, not super extensive, but big enough case marking system. So all of this stuff is double marked. But um, languages really like to do that. They love to be redundant. And so what you'll see a lot in these head marking languages is not just one strategy, but usually um, two strategies at the very least. So maybe um, everything is head marked on the verb, uh, but there's no gender. And then there's also case. Or everything's marked on the verb, there's no gender, and there's also a more or less strict word order that can only be varied for, you know, pragmatic reasons. Um, or maybe there's lots of gender, and then uh, the gender is marked on the verb. But if you look at something like Swahili, it's got gender uh, that's marked extensively, um, and also word order. Um, so that's uh, two things there. Um, and then maybe you have uh, different mixtures uh, here and there. But usually what you don't see is something where there's only one system, let's say um, just head marking, just regular old head marking on the verb, and then you can mix up whatever else. Uh, there's usually a way to figure out who does what to whom when you have three nouns that are all of the exact same person, number, and gender. There's got to be some default way to figure that out. 
because I mean in any one of these languages you could say um, I don't know like this man gave that man that man that doesn't make any sense uh, let's do it with fish this fish gave that fish this fish uh, you could say something like that. I just said it in English, so presumably you could say it in every language. And presumably, if it's the same word and the same, uh, it'll be in the same gender, and it will be in the same number because I gave it the same number. So whatever the marking is, it'll be identical for each one of those. And there has to be a way to figure out which one does what. So there has to be a default there, whether it's case marking or word order or, um, no, I think that's it case marking or word or blah, whatever. Anyway, it's got to be something there uh, as, a, as a default. Um, if you're creating a non-natural language, you can mix this stuff up if you want. This is just the way that natural languages tend to do it, just because eh, it's easy. It's nice to have things doubly, triply, quadruply marked to make it absolutely clear what's going on, and also to give you a little bit of freedom in mixing things up if you want to. Just a quick note that head marking is different from noun incorporation. That's a separate phenomenon. There's sometimes overlap between the two, but it's something totally different that'll be dealt with in a separate video. That's it for this episode. If you have a question you'd like me to answer on the show, please leave it in the comments or send me an email at djpquery at gmail.com. If you want to see more episodes like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching. Hey kitty, hey kitty, say hi. Hi kitty, yay! Do you have anything to say? Anything nice to say? She has nothing to say. <laughs>